I'm Mary Davidson, and it's our community. Our guest today is an old friend, and her name is Marilyn Scaife. And Marilyn, for gosh, a number of years, was chair of the parole board right. in the state of Kansas, which is a full-time job. And now, and you traveled all over. It, it, it is a traveling job, is it not? Right. Yeah. Right. And now, Marilyn is the executive director of the Kansas Reentry Policy Council for the Department of Corrections in the state of Kansas. So you just kind of changed thinking, but not very far away. Right. She told me, and I was shocked when I heard it, but she said in any given crowd, one person in 45 has either been incarcerated or is under supervision. That's scary, Marilyn. Right, it's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. Right. What's going on? Well, I think that's been a trend for a long time. Um, I've been in corrections since the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us who've been around since that amount of time tend to think that that's about the time drugs really became um, difficult and uh, everyone could observe the effect of them and so people were frightened and there was a lot of laws enacted regarding drugs and it just seemed to explode in the numbers also, I think, with the baby boomers coming of adult age. So um, it was all the way um, growing in all different kinds of ways. And uh, I was just at the very beginning of that growth. Yeah. In fact, I was one of the few women that was in the, the corrections at that time. Well, and the scary part is that we keep on building more prisons because in Kansas, in the past 20 years, the state spending on corrections has increased from $60 million to $243 million, give or take. That's a lot of increase. Mm -hmm. Are we sending too many people to prison? What? Should we? I don't know. What do we do here? We can't, <laughs> we can't keep building prisons because it's we don't know what to do right. with them. It, it, people want to be safe. Yeah. We don't want disorder in our communities. And at the same time, it's very expensive to build the structure, maintain the prisons 24-7, you know, and some people stay for life. So it, That is a gloomy prospect. <laughs> so it's very expensive. Yeah, that yeah. system is very expensive. And uh, in, the, in Kansas, we have uh, what we call the Sentencing Commission that studies the trends of populating of how we populate our prisons according to the laws we pass gives that feedback back to the legislature so we're monitoring it and trying to adjust it all the time and yet you know what the people want oftentimes will control who does go to prison but the, pr the philosophy in Kansas is that our prison beds should be saved for the most violent um, crimes do you think having said that do you think the reality is that we're incarcerating too many first offenders? In Kansas, I would say we're not. Not. The thing that uh, happens to sometimes to first offenders is the first time offenders is they escalate. Mm -hmm. They can't control their behavior. They get in trouble. It's in, in the system, we call that a violation. And they will end up in prison for technical violations, such as doing drugs, not keeping a job, even absconding, which means running away. But that does account for a lot of our prison beds yes, being does. filled is a violation of parole. Is that not true? Nationally and in Kansas, uh, we have addressed it in Kansas, but yes, mm -hmm. that was a big problem for Kansas. Is the recidivation, uh, uh, recidivism rate, would you say, way too high? It nationally or in Kansas? Well, let's talk about it because <laughs> okay. Kansas really does, and, and, I, and I think that's a point that we must make. Kansas really does better than most of the right. other states. So let's say in general and in Kansas. In general, yes, it's probably too high. In Kansas, we can always do better. Uh, we set out consciously to do better. And uh, while I was on the parole board, I believe the highest number of violators per month that return was somewhere around 225 a month. And it was then that everybody said, whoa, wait a minute. 
this is going to mean that we're going to be building another prison in the very near future. Is that the way we want to spend our money? Mm -hmm. And so there was a combination of studies and consultants, et cetera, and it was addressed with a strategy, and that's part of the reentry. Um, and today, I just looked up the numbers before I came, and the average monthly in, uh, inmate return inmate who has returned for violations is about 96 a month. So you see, we've cut it about 50 percent. But between 2004 and 2006, the number of parole revocations dropped 50 percent. Right. I mean, that is. That, something to yeah. be very proud of. Yes, and a lot of those were probation violators. That was the next wave. After we got the parole violators, who are people who have served time and then are out on supervision after they have been released from prison, the probation violators have never been to prison. They are given supervision from the courts, and those people were violating at a high number. So we applied that strategy, the state did, applied that strategy to that group of people and reduced it uh, again. So that, those methods work. But all that enabled the state to cancel the prison beds right. that they were planning on building. And indeed, um, the strategy and the policy um, thought through well saved the state a lot of money. Right. Actually, it reduced the beds uh, probably to somewhere around 800. That, it, that may not sound like a lot of, of uh, a big number, but in comparison to our capacity, that is a very respectable number to yeah. reduce, when, especially when neighboring states are increasing. Let me ask you this. Um, let's talk about Jessica's Law just for a okay. minute, because I have a feeling that Jessica's Law uh, is going to increase the number of sex offenders that are going to be in cars. Could Absolutely. you comment on that? Yes. It, I believe you could see the trend that it's growing now, yes. Uh, in fact, that number steadily grew the whole time I was on the parole board. Uh, there's an awareness about it. There's also the tougher laws. Anytime you enact tougher laws, uh, they, they come in and they stay longer. That means that they'll accumulate, so to speak, uh, in, the, in the prison. And so you get a higher percentage of your population turning over to that particular offense or sex offense in this case. All these good things that, uh, and, I, and I know that to say good things is a little bit of a peculiar <laughs> word, but, but certainly the prison population has, has decreased. And um, all of this leads me to say that even though we've had a reduced in the rates of a reduction, we still have to concentrate on reducing the rates of failure, either first time offenders, fifth time, whatever it is. And I think that through the reentry policy council, because policy is really uh, the gear that drives the the effect, I would say. Right. That through yes. the the policy council, thinking can be done to continually reduce the rates of incarceration. Mm -hmm. Right. Our our policy council is made up of cabinet level positions. Uh, the chair of the parole board, so I sat on the council when it was first formed, and um, the chair of the sentencing commission. Uh, but m I think the important uh, addition of uh, people on that council are the social services, the secretary of SRS, uh, the president of the housing corporation for the state. Those kind of those kind of people bring resources. And frankly, that's what it takes a lot of times to keep people from resorting to uh, criminal behavior to survive. I might suggest to you that the thinking of the Policy Council and others like it mm -hmm. over the country have changed um, law enforcement mm -hmm. from punitive, absolutely punitive, to more of a, a social work kind of um, prevention or um, policies that um, cut down the recidivism rate. Well, community policing so? is mm -hmm. probably where, what you're referring mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think community policing was going on about the time reentry was, was uh, named. All of the departments of corrections across the country are saying, but we always did this. We did. We always tried to direct our offenders to successful outcomes. 
but we didn't have real clear defined strategies and I think that's what's different now. So we can talk about it, we can show people, we can get partners, we can get collaboration in a strategic manner. But all the actors are at the table right. in this reentry right. policy. Right, we're all council. working together. That's right. It's not one policy council, it's not one person, it's not one agency. That collaboration is what's making the uh, whole thing work. Well, and in any given prison population, or people who are in danger of becoming part of the prison population. There are a number of challenges, many challenges, that this policy council has to continually address. And one of them is uh, poor basic education and marketable skills. They don't have any basic education and they don't have very many marketable skills. That is a challenge. It is a huge challenge. These people are dropouts. Yeah. They, that's why they, they don't have the skills. And uh, now they're adults, if they're in the adult system, they get out at 25, 40, whatever age, and they have to start completely over, and they have to mark the felony box, as we refer to it, on their job application. So there's, they come out with a real uphill struggle. And uh, one of our best partners in this policy council mm -hmm. is commerce. They have offenders as a strategic population and we're working uh, with their wor regional workforce development boards to set up some opportunities which include training. That's a very important piece. Well yeah because that's the other right. another challenge. They right. don't have any and they don't get a lot of training in prison or they no, have not. No. There's no room. There's no money. That's not what the Department of Corrections is good at doing. Right. Right. So we need those partners to come in and, and do that work. Talk so, about commerce a little bit more, how, what they have done to try to... Well, we have, uh, we have several training programs that they have helped set up in the facility. There are some uh, Department of Labor grants that have come to the Department of Corrections and they partner in various ways with the Department of Commerce. Um, we are trying currently to work with the five regional uh, local workforce investment board directors to uh, strategize some uh, collaboration with community colleges or schools that will help us find training programs, not necessarily just for offenders, but that offenders will not be ostracized. Uh, ost well, yeah, they won't be kept out of yeah. or that's something that, yes, they can do and get jobs realistically. Because so many, if, if there are training and skill opportunities within the prison system, they're often not opportunities and skills that translate into the opportunities out in the community. Exactly. There, there's, there's a big disconnect there. Yes. You would never Nobody train. Nobody makes license plates. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you would never train certain offenders to do certain jobs. I mean, it's very clear a sex yeah. offender would not be trained to do child care. I mean, that, that's, right. that's, that's a... Uh, common sense. Well, so. and that's another, that's another problem because there are uh, statutory and regulatory barriers. We're working uh, on some of those. Talk about that a little bit. Well, there's, there's a number of, and I think this started with the uh, drug era too. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of uh, statutes where boards of certain industries uh, are banning or barring offenders from that field. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't want to name them, no, no. but I can say one that, that is obvious, it should remain that way, is an offender cannot be a doctor. You cannot have a felony and... Well, banking is another one. Right. That's obvious. Right. Yeah. Those are some obvious fields and mm -hmm. they make sense. But believe me, there are lots and lots of other ones on the books who do the same thing. And some of them, again, were just fear, and uh, we, we do one person at a time taking them through the process to see if, they'll, if the board will allow them to have a license. And so it's very slow work, but we're So the policy council is trying to change that. <coughs> right, that, where, it's, yeah. where it's reasonable, right. Well, and you know, I think also the policy council has set an example of cooperative thinking and policy construction. Uh, that often is not there in the in the workplace because there is not a lot of coordination uh, among systems in the right. workforce. 
Right. In fact, I said I will feel like my job has been successful if I can see a mission statement in our partners that show offenders or corrections as part of their strategy. And that's beginning to happen. Isn't that right? right. SRS, isn't it, Commerce. I mean, you've been at this long enough right. to see things happen. Right. And isn't that nice? Right. It is. Right. And, it, and before, I mean, corrections pretty much worked as a silo. Yeah. Um, and so did all the other d uh, agencies. So if someone had a substance abuse problem and they were an offender, oh, give them back to the Department of Corrections. Well, no one is trained in the Department of Corrections to that's do not drug what they treatment. Do, but that's no. not what they do. No, that's not what we do. So, so. I think, and I, and I also <coughs> think that public policy is, as I said, it is the gear that, ca that causes the effect to happen. And so many people are not good at public policy. But I think Kansas has been extremely good at it because it's been such a collaborative effort. Right, and we've been nationally recognized for that. Our Secretary of Corrections, I think, is very responsible for leading the agency to think that way and to act that way. And we've gotten good results, so therefore um, we're, we're cited as an example of good policy and corrections. Isn't that nice? Right. I, I, it makes me ever more proud to be a, a Kansan, <laughs> truly, because right. our state is on the cutting edge of many things. Right. Well, as and, we uh, speak, one of uh, the people that I work with in central office in Topeka is showing a representative from Australia our reentry programs in Topeka. Really? So we're getting international visitors as well. See, I think that I'm, I, I'm just um, amazed. I also think that the Policy Council in the collaborative effort allows focus to fall not just on the prisoner, or right, ex-prisoner, right. because it is a, it's a, 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 a collaborative effort among the people in that family, too. Absolutely. There's, uh, everybody has to be involved. I mean, the offender t has to also. If he, doesn't, he or she doesn't want to do this, it's not going to happen. But we can help them, train them, and if the community doesn't want it to happen, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Well, it's even so. more difficult because prisoners, ex-prisoners, tend to congregate in, uh, I call it clumping, but that's not a very scientific <laughs> word, but they do, they tend to congregate, mm -hmm. and that makes it a little difficult as right. well. Yeah, so. there's, some, there's some issues with that a around, you know, their feeling of success and, or failure, and, <clears throat> you know, they feel comfortable. They go where they feel comfortable. Yes, and so oftentimes that's our strategy is to get them out of that comfort level. No, we don't want you to live there. We want you to live someplace else where, where you will be on your own and you will be forced to use some of your talent. Well, you and know. you'll be forced to um, make contacts with the right people who right have people. not been mm -hmm. in prison with you. Pro-social. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Do you have trouble with the families? Well, from the days of my uh, having a caseload, I could say yes. Now I think we have a lot better understanding of family systems. But we still are not experts at that. We need a lot of assistance, and um, we're, we're working on that. We have a couple of pilot projects. In Shawnee and Sedgwick? Uh, more, yes. Mm -hmm. Talk There's about a, those a little bit, because I think those are really interesting. The, the pilot projects? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they actually, I think, have become more than pilot projects. They, they have really uh, influenced us to the, where it's the way we do business now. But the Shawnee County, which is Topeka, uh, project was started by the original grant given to all the states and we chose to spend the money setting up this uh, program in, in Topeka. And uh, it was designed to have the offenders in the facility for a year before they were released. With and their family or without their family? No, just, uh, just, just with them mm -hmm. and, and, and do intensive programming. Mm -hmm. And now, talk about intensive programming, just so I don't want to go over that too fast. Okay, well. Intensive programming, All right, yes. maybe th we need to back up a yeah, little bit. Yeah, because I want to define intensive programming, because that okay. year is critical. Very much so. Right, one of the uh, best practice or evidence-based practices mm -hmm. for this work is to first assess the individual, and we have specialized assessment tools that we use on, on the offenders, mm -hmm. 
and we find their areas of strength and weaknesses, and the weaknesses indicate um, their risk to reoffend. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we are concerned, but we're not concerned that they're going to fail at, say, uh, music or painting right, or something right. like that. This is a this is an assessment to see where are the areas that will lead them back to criminal uh, behavior. The inability to read, for example. Right. Or substance abuse or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Or, and family is one of, is a very strong one on there, or family uh, orientation or involvement or whatever. If that is contributing to their problems, we try to work with the their family members. Of course, that's voluntary with their families. Mm -hmm. So but some of them, you know, I think it's only fair to say here, many of them really do want to be a contributing part of the community. Absolutely. Everybody doesn't want to be a loser and a and a constant inmate. They don't they don't all want to do right. that. Right. It broke my heart during the time when I was on the parole board for family members to come to public comments and talk about their loved ones who were inside and and the circumstances that led to that, and the, I mean, most of them have the awareness of what went wrong. Maybe they just didn't have the tools, or maybe they didn't have the awareness at the time. But if you can but, give them the seeds yes. of those tools during that year, their chances increase immeasurably, right. I would think. Right, and over time, as, as they have visitation and uh, communicate with their loved ones, they do work out those problems. Mm -hmm. So, um, we try to help with that, but again, that isn't our best suit because that's not what most of the Department of Corrections personnel is trained for. We need we need expert in that area but to help. Got to go back to that policy um, right. reentry because everybody's at the table. That's right, and that that is really really important. Mm -hmm. Do you have any way to measure success in these pilot projects? Yes, as a matter of fact, KU is our evaluator. Mm -hmm. And we have a uh, person in the uh, staff at Central Office who oversees the evaluation for reentry projects. A lot of a, a lot of our reentry is still right now on. Uh, I don't want to say they're all pilots, but uh, they they don't pertain to everyone in the population. It's difficult to apply some of these principles across the board. So uh, we're evaluating those in, in very carefully so that we know that we understand the work and then we're going to you know put them out in a broader way. Would you say but that replication is uh, the potential glitch in the system mm -hmm. being able to replicate those pilot projects? Right and they're different in every community. Yeah. We have we actually have a project in Wyandotte County that's just started. It, they're just now coming out. Are they called the CORE the, project or the, something like well, that? Well, all of them are called the, the uh, uh, Kansas Offender uh -huh. Risk and risk Reduction and Reentry. Yes. So if I called so. any of them that, I'd be right. Right, <laughs> right. But there, there are three that are very strategic, and, and those are the three, that the uh, Shawnee, Sedgwick, and Wyandotte County. But there are pieces of it everywhere across the state. If people wanted to read more about this or know more about these pilot programs in Shawnee, Sedgwick, and Wyandotte County, could they go to the Kansas Department of Corrections? Uh, to the website. To the right. website. And there's a, uh, just click on reentry. On reentry. And I think there is an evaluation report na right now on, uh, at least on the Shawnee one. Because, you know, I have to be honest, we're all taxpayers sure. in this state. And I think that these wonder, these pilot projects have the potential to save us as taxpayers a lot of money. Yes. And also produce people who at some point are able, willing, and prepared to contribute to the to economy. To be protective, yeah. right, right. So, and there's a great deal of talent behind the walls. I mean, people who can do amazing things, but they have, for one reason or another, ended up in prison. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, I serve on the Judicial Qualifications mm -hmm. Committee, and the Judicial Qualifications Committee adjudicates matters of ethics and morality among the judges in the state of Kansas. And some of the complaints, in fact, quite a few of the complaints, uh, come from incarcerated prisoners. And I have to tell you, whether they're right or wrong, they are often very well written and very well put mm -hmm. together. They're not all dumb. Just because right. they're in jail right. doesn't mean that they don't have ability. And that's I think right. that's a point that needs to be 
taken and made. That's right. So, yeah. And, but, you know, I, I read here that unless the reduction in parole revocation is sustained and the number of probation revocations is reduced, the prison population will increase by 26% or approximately 2,300 people between 07 and 16 between 2007 and 2060. You know, we got to do more. We got to do it better and we got to do more. So we got to really push on these um, on these projects. And I think that um, um, investing in an effective and accessible community-based substance abuse treatment programs is one of those places. Right. You know, there, talk about the drug court a little bit in Wichita. Well, I'm not real familiar with it because it, it really isn't part of the Department of Corrections, but it, it has, uh, it's, it's a model that it's, it's in Kansas City and there's one in Wyandotte County. And so um, the, the advantage of that court, I think, is that you can keep people accountable exactly, and you also can reinforce them. Well, so. and another, and another interesting piece of those that drug court is that it too is a collaborative effort because the social worker or the uh, whatever person, the SRS worker, they're a part of it, and it's no longer an ex parte communication on the part of the judge. The judge and the social worker mm -hmm. and the SRS person and the attorneys, they all right. try to work it out. So I, you it, know, I yeah, it's it's very similar in mm -hmm. philosophy. So, you know, the, the wraparound services, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have a wish list, I mean, you have been involved in corrections one way or another. I'm not going to tell how long. <laughs> long time. <laughs> you can do the math. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I did what have a you, respite what, in there <laughs> when I sold what you, advertising. What, what, do you, what would you wish would happen in the, in the years to come, in the next uh, five to ten years? What, what would you like to see? It'd be so easy to say, I hope the Department of Corrections gets funded. <laughs> but that's, if there's a lot of money, I think you could, you could do a lot of things easily, that's but that's not going to happen. No. So, so given that. Right. Given that, um, well, I think I would hope that the legislature and uh, the Department of Corrections are on the same page. I think they, I think they mostly are now and that people who in our communities will hear this message about what works and support that and insist on that. In other words, it's not just the state that needs to do that. We have county and we have local co uh, courts and correction systems. And if, if everyone is on the same page about that, I think we can turn some things around in our society. Some, there's a responsibility there for every institution that you can just about think of, education, uh, churches, the, the faith-based organizations want to be involved, but it, it's hard to find the roles for all of those different people. So It's also hard to provide the oversight for the uh, peripheral kind of folks, for the um, faith-based organizations, right. and, and, and they have the potential to play an extremely Very important, important part. And, and we're searching, um, there's a, in Johnson County, there's a criminal justice advisory board. I'm a member of that. And <coughs> um, retired Attorney General Bob Steffen is the chair. And we are working with several churches, uh, ministers, um, and one of the things that we would hope to do in the next few months, I hope, is to define how the churches play a part in all of this. And uh, they don't know, and we don't have any experience with it. So uh, we keep searching, and I think, you know, mentors are an idea, but that's difficult to keep up, and on and on and on. So, uh, you know, I think the, the local community will figure out Congregation how they, has to be yes, willing to. how they, how they yeah. want to participate yeah. and where they fit in all of it. Individuals are doing wonderful things. But how? But what does the role of the church have to do with this? And I, I don't know. I've said to several ministers, "You're you're the ones that are going to have to really come up with a message. Government doesn't go into that Government arena. Government doesn't do that. Right. And I have to say that um, 
it is indeed our community and we all have a part in the collaborative effort to reduce the prison populations and to increase the contributions of all of our citizens in the state of Kansas to the ever, ever needed uh, economy. So it is our community and it is everybody's responsibility. I'm Mary Davidson. Thank you for being with us.